This week on WSKG's new weekly art series, Expressions. You get lost in a painting, you forget about time, you forget about everything else. And they shape our ideas of the world and our ideas of ourselves. Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist and scholar, had written that um, it's the job of the artist to hold a mirror up to society and to show them th what we see going on in today's world. From her work, it's obvious Kathleen Huddle of Elmira sees a world full of beauty. But she also sees injustice. I always think of him when I'm painting my uh, political work, and he also said, to live in a society without the arts is to live in a wasteland. And I often think, too, that I'm fortunate to be in a country where I'm able to express my views this way. I'm Kathleen Huddle. I'm a mother and a painter, photographer, writer. Kathleen's main inspirations are the Italian Renaissance and the female archetype. Primarily, I do paint a lot of uh, women. Figure painting is something that I like to do. Uh, most generally, I like to work very large because I think it makes more of an impact. I have a, a large angel that's seven feet tall. That is, I consider my master work, and it took me maybe about a year and a half to complete. That image, I've been able to transfer it, reduce it, use it on my cards, my Christmas ornaments, and that, Im that image shows up a lot in my work. Depending on the time of year, you may find Kathleen making her signature holiday ornaments, which were once written up in an international magazine. My message is peace, and I like to put that on the back of all of my ornaments. Kathleen has a knack for overcoming obstacles and attaining the goals she sets. This has been copyrighted, this technique, because I totally came up with it out of necessity. I invested, I'm going to say, approximately $500 in the stamps. And I experimented quite a bit. I did come up with a way to make it work. When I'm done, I want this to look like a glass ornament that's really old, and it has kind of an old world renaissance look to them. Ever since the article was published, they became quite popular, and they began to sell out. I did my grandmother's wedding portrait here, and on the back is my grandfather. While she felt born to be an artist, I was one of these kids that was uh, drawing in school when I was supposed to be studying, you know. Kathleen experienced a bit of a rebirth of her own after visiting Italy. I made a trip to Italy about 12 years ago, and that's when I was greatly inspired by the, um, most especially by the Bernini angels that I saw there, but all the Italian artwork that I had studied about in my art history ca classes at Elmira College. We walked from St. Peter's a short distance over a bridge called the uh, Ponte Sant'Angelo, which is a bridge of angels, and that was all designed by Bernini. There, were there are 12 angels. And I just had a moment where I couldn't even breathe. I had my camera in my hand. I forgot to take pictures. It was, wasn't really a religious uh, moment. It was just um, ascetic arrest is what I called it. I just saw such beauty. I couldn't move. But then I came to and I took all kinds of pictures and when I came home I really wanted to do large angels but I'm not a sculptor and I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't have the means. I'm a painter so what I did was the next best thing to make it three-dimensional was to do it on a large piece of wood. Again improvising. Kathleen's path to artistry also involves some improvisation. I graduated in 1988 with a BA in art but I had a heavy concentration in painting, photography, uh, classical mythology. I went part-time as an evening student 
took me eight years. In those years, I had twins. Just recently, I self-published a book about, it's a memoir about being a mother and an artist, and it's called Mama with a Blue Face. That's a quote that my mother always used. She'd say, I'm talking to you until I'm blue in the face, and it wasn't until I had four children of my own that I, I knew what she meant by that expression. I painted myself with a blue face, and the twins are running all around. I painted three each because it's, I felt like they were multiplying on, on this one crazy day I had with them. And I gave myself an extra foot to, with sneakers with wings on them to, to fly after the twins. Despite the trying moments, her daughters actually enhanced her career. It turns out that being a mother is a good thing for an artist because the subject of my work are my children. This is a portrait of my daughter, Christine. She reminded me of Vermeer's painting, Girl with a Pearl Earring. A motherly demeanor seems ever present with Kathleen. You want to put a lot of time and pride into them. Take your time, use a fine tip brush. Don't have a cup of coffee in the morning because your hands shake a little bit. But an inner child who recognizes the importance of play is never far away either. I'll paint here in the back of my studio and uh, when I take a break, I'll go over and sit at my desk and I keep that kind of messy and I keep all my beads and my jewelry out and then um, I'll just pick up and it's kind of like playing. I call it playing with my jewelry. So I'm kind of like a magpie, like those birds that, you know, they see something sparkly and they dive down for it. Kathleen is also a pacifist. I love looking at that angel. It gives me, um, it, it gives me um, peace in my heart when I look at it. And she's holding a sign with the most important word in the world, and that is peace. Like any good pacifist, she's found a constructive outlet for her anger. If somebody really ticks me off or something and I have an opinion, I'm going to say it with my paintbrush. I just designed a bumper sticker, Goddess for President, Mothers for House and Senate. What it means is if women were in power, if there were mothers running the country, there would be no war and we would figure out a way to, how to do that. Would you say you're a feminist? Yeah. <laughs> just a wee bit. <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> I am. Even if you disagree with her politics, you might agree that being a feminist goes hand in hand with being an advocate for four daughters. My second oldest daughter, Kate, was married. And while we didn't speak to her girls, we assume Kathleen has been a very good role model for them. Not only with her many accomplishments, but also her messages of peace, of seeing your dreams through and never being afraid to express yourself. From doing my work, it's almost like therapy, only it's cheaper. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I'm kidding when I say that, but it's when you, you get lost in the painting, you forget about time, you forget about everything else, and then um, it, it's just something I need to do. It's striking the extent to which one finds masks throughout the world. The idea behind the exhibit was to put the visitor in the place of a traveler. It just seemed immediately clear to me that the kind of conventional uh, approach to showing objects from other places, what might be thought of as anthropological objects, didn't seem to fit the material. Often in museums, there is the focus on that originary context, where it was made or where it was originally used. But really the bulk of the life of most of these objects is not in those contexts. The objects are so marvellous that we really wanted them to prevail and to, for people to really look at them. Because what happens so often is that people are so busy reading text that you hardly get to look up. But on the other hand, we didn't want people to just admire the objects. We wanted them to also be thinking about the kinds of meanings that we imbue them with. They do become 
very meaningful to us and they shape our, our ideas of the world and our ideas of ourselves. So this is, in a lot of ways, this exhibit is, is really about exploring the ongoing lives of objects beyond that original context. The exhibition is organized around the themes of travel, of trade, of consumption, of change, of how traditions change and how they're living. And so it works to break apart some uh, notions of, of cultures as static, even things that look very traditional or seem to be very you know, authentic in some way. People often will make a juxtaposition between an authentic object versus an object that's made for a tourist trade. All of them are part of living cultures and we wanted to highlight this idea that you know these people who make these are alive, these are living traditions and they have histories and it's through people you know moving throughout the world, global travel, hundreds of years of it, that a lot of these objects come to be. This was the inspiration for it. This retablo, it's a mask shop. It kind of encapsulated this idea of, of traveling and going into a shop that's lined with all kinds of masks and identifying with one or two in particular and, and just being surrounded by the masks. So we were hoping to recreate some of that in this exhibit, that you're engaging more on a sensory level with these objects rather than a very didactic text. Masks have been a fun thing to collect. I think the materials are fascinating. What you find throughout the exhibition are personal accounts of the collectors, They're the narratives that they told us. I purchased these masks in South Africa in shops filled with zebra skins, ivory, leopard pelts, stuffed animal heads and walls of all kinds of masks. And what was so striking about those narratives is that they weren't so much about the objects themselves, but, but about the circumstances in which they acquired them, the places that they were at. And this is exactly the way in which souvenirs operate. We drove all the way out to Colima, Mexico to see a volcano erupt, but the volcano was hidden by the clouds and we couldn't see anything. So we stopped at a small restaurant for lunch and the walls were decorated with masks. They told us that the artist lived nearby, so we got This direct. idea of a souvenir not being something that is insignificant, but rather something that really uh, evokes memory and um, evokes um, senses of a place. What we f focus on here was having people think about their own relationships to the objects. So thinking for themselves about their own travel and their own relationships with souvenirs and how objects work in that way to provoke memory and take them to another place. But we also uh, look not only at souvenirs but the way in which objects like museum objects can allow us to travel in our imaginations or in the memories of imagined worlds. That's really what we were trying to provoke. In one of the areas of the exhibit called Objects on the Move, we have a series of masks from Africa. And Africa in particular is a place that people often think of very romantically as somehow timeless, exotic. <laughs> and we wanted to highlight um, some of the materials that are used in the masks, such as cowrie shells and glass beads, that there's a long history of long distance trade through which these items come into these various areas of Africa. And in turn, a lot of um, materials from Africa and traditions from Africa get diffused throughout other places of the world. Particularly in uh, Central and South America, people don't necessarily make their own masks for the events for which these are used. And so, you'd have these mask shops that are overflowing with masks and costumes and so on. And we wanted to kind of evoke that idea of the mask shop. The director of exhibitions, Peter Klosky, came up with this idea for creating a, a mask shop that actually didn't use masks from the collection. They made paper mache masks with the idea that people might kind of pick them up and try them on and, and uh, think of themselves in a mask shop. So it's to, it's to introduce a kind of an interactive element. 
But we also have these, these other masks alongside that are from the collection to uh, convey this idea of an abundance of extraordinarily varied mask forms that you, are, that you do find in, in these mask shops. I'm very drawn to the area of the mask shop. With Carnival, we see masks uh, taking on all kinds of new meanings. And uh, while there are deep historical traditions of masks being, being used in uh, Carnival and, and, and various societies, uh, we can see those traditions being modified and taken up in different ways, particularly here we might say in uh, you know, uh, Mardi Gras in New Orleans and uh, you know, many different instances. Another example of um, highlighting cultures as living and constantly changing and being recreated is the paper mache mask of E.T. And I know um, it's somewhat jarring to some people as they enter the gallery because there are all these masks that um, conform much more to I our ideas of what you know a, a traditional ethnic <laughs> mask might be. But I think this, this E.T. mask is really emblematic of how things like popular culture uh, enter into, tradi into traditions and become something that um, people draw upon. So you know these masks can be used in parades and processions and it, and it isn't always you know um, an image that reaches back centuries. It can be um, a very immediate inspiration and a very immediate reference that's being made. There's uh, yeah. animal heads, but, uh, but also some masks that look uh, very, very much like the kinds of masks you might expect to see in a masked ball. You know, they have a kind of an Italianate kind of uh, feel. It's really nice to have um, all these masks from Erica Downey, who's a local mask maker. And that also shows how it's, it's a living tradition and something that's happening locally. And it's nice to have her, her words with the masks as well, talking about what inspired her to use certain designs or the meanings behind certain masks, which we don't have with a lot of these other masks. The mask maker lent a number of, of her own, including one that she wore for her own wedding and one that she made for her husband. I was profoundly impressed by a large feather mask in people's pottery as a child and said to my mother, I want to wear that when I get married. She's uh, based in Binghamton, but she has clients uh, throughout the country. So we were glad to have the opportunity to have such an accomplished local artist be part of the exhibition. It's been wonderful. It's been so great working with the Robertson and, you know, and learning how much of a collaborative process it is. Pam and I had some ideas at the outset, but they really were shaped and changed as we started talking to the folks in education, the people doing the design. We came up with the conceptualization for it and the text and some ideas about which objects we wanted associated with which ideas. But the museum came up with a design for the exhibition. I'm an anthropologist, but I specialize in the anthropology of art worlds and museums. So I've written critically about museums and exhibitions quite a lot, but I've never actually mounted one. So it's been a, it's been a very interesting experience for me. Before I started graduate school, uh, I worked with collections at Harvard University with their anthropology collections and uh, also as an archaeologist. I'm unearthing objects all the time. A lot of times people from the community will come through and want to talk about what you're excavating and so there's some informal, impromptu curation that happens where you're interpreting objects kind of on the spot. But, but this is my first gallery museum exhibit. These two masks here are really interesting. It seemed to me to be an excellent opportunity for a graduate student to have this kind of uh, experience and for the museum to make stronger connections with the university, which you know, I, th I think is in a community this size, the more we can, we can do to strengthen the, the uh, relationships between the university and the community, I think, the better. What's been the biggest treat is seeing people in the ex exhibition, seeing people 
looking at the masks, reading the displays, and, and, and talking to them, seeing how they, how they experience it, um, what they enjoy about it, and what they don't enjoy about it. If there's anything that people are put off by in this exhibit, it's not having that label next to each object saying country of origin or title of the object. And, um, and that was a very conscious decision. When you have labels that say, this is from Guatemala, this is part of this particular dance, this is from you know, West Africa, this is from, that kind of answers an immediate question and the questions tend to stop. And we wanted to foster more questions. I also wanted to be uh, very mindful of a history of frustration uh, in anthropology and elsewhere with the way in which objects from other societies have very often been represented. In so far as you know, we're inclined to say, here's a mask from such and such and it means this. But, but actually these meanings shift over time. Light bulbs were once upon a time used for the eyeballs. They differ among members of a population, and as objects travel around, their meaning shift. And so, what we, what I really wanted to uh, to ensure in this exhibition that I didn't end up reproducing exactly the same kinds of frustrations that uh, that I myself have experienced in relation to exhibitions of ethnographic objects. So it's more of an experience as if you were entering a mask shop like that depicted in their tableau at the beginning. That there aren't a lot of guiding text panels to tell you what to think about these masks. It's more about your personal experience with them, your interaction at that moment. And we want you spending more time face to face <laughs> with these masks. songwriter thing they're doing here is a great thing. It's a great opportunity for people to come out and actually listen to people writing their own music, which you don't get to hear too much. And usually you go out and it's a top 40 band at a bar that's in the background. It's really a great atmosphere over there and I'm just so glad that I got to be a part of it. It's cool. Support live local music. And the other thing I like about that particular event is that people come in there to specifically listen to music. And they give you the respect of being a musician and there's really not a lot of chatter in the background. Here at the Songwriter Showcase, I give you Pinecone Fletcher. My name is Pinecone and it's a moniker for traveling. I got a guitar probably when I was about 10 or so. My father hawked an old pocket watch and bought me this old beat up thing. It was quite atrocious, but I've been playing ever since then. This song was uh, written for him. And as far as uh, playing it out, I never really had any aspirations for that, but I uh, met a, another fellow hobo when I was 19, called himself the Scarecrow, and he took me out on the road with him and showed me how to hop the trains and get by, and I had my guitar with me, and we found it was a great way to earn some extra pocket money and get free meals. With its lawful Lonnie Prime. But he wants to leave his home. I hear old black man a lot when I go and sing. 60 year old is the number that usually comes up. I take it as a compliment because that's what I grew up listening to. A lot of blues music and early jazz and ragtime and that sort of thing. And I, and I try to portray that in my music. A lot of early vaudeville I'm into as well. I'm originally from the upstate New York area, um, but I left when I was 19 and just been kind of traveling around the country. Well, I've been a hobo all my life. This is the uh, first record. It's a lot of songs just about traveling. 
I was pretty much in the middle of nowhere and I wasn't going to find a, a quick ride out of there. So I found an old onion barn on this giant farm down there and I figured I'd sleep in there for the night. So I hopped inside that barn, figured I'd be gone by morning, but uh, I wasn't. That farmer got up early and uh, <laughs> I woke up to him and he didn't seem upset or anything, which I thought was kind of strange. Turns out it was Brad Morrison who had worked the industry for a number of years before he retired and had worked with Fish and uh, the Figs who were on Capitol and a bunch of other bands. Uh, we had breakfast and after that he asked me to play a song, which I did. And he asked me if he'd like me to uh, have a record made. What I really enjoy about music as you all know, the most romantic of all love songs is those of the chain gang. <laughs> so, you can go into a town and have a bunch of people come out and watch you play. Even if it's only for an hour, you can take those people away from their, their daily routine, their lives of just going to work, coming home, watching TV, going to bed, getting up the next day, doing it again. And for a very short time, you can take them out of that and give them something special, something exciting, something fun that they can remember. But it's pretty much all I do. I mean, I don't have a job or anything. I just play music. And the stars play it's a long-term goal. I've, I've always joked with my friends that uh, I was going to be known as the greatest hobo that ever lived. <laughs> My name is Dina. I'm a singer-songwriter from Endicott, New York, and my sound is Avril Lavigne meets Mandy Moore. This shouldn't take long at all. My mind got a track. I've been performing since I was five years old. I'll call back. How have you been? I was classically trained when I was 13, 14 years old, something like that. But I still do take voice lessons and work on that all the time because I always need to get better. This next song I wrote about all the beautiful things in the world and all the things I knew that, that I always wanted to be a, a pop singer. Happen. This is called So Beautiful. It's like the best way for me to express my emotions or to tell people things through my music because I'm not really good at telling someone how I feel. It's easier for me to perform it to sing or dance. I have so many different emotions, especially with the new record, Mirror. It goes through, you know, just happy pop songs to really dark, depressing songs. And everything in between that. So I think there's definitely a song on the record that everyone can relate to, I think. I had an EP come out in uh, 2006. Um, it's called The Way You Look At Me, and uh, five songs. And, uh, and then I just released Mirror, which is my first full-length CD, and uh, that has 18 songs on it. playing my uh, record in Europe. My one cover song that I remade was Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow. It's a really upbeat punk kind of version. I did a video for that.
and they're actually re-editing that video to make it MTV worthy <laughs> right now, so I'm really excited about that. I must go where I am safe. Being second best or average isn't, isn't good enough, so I have to reach for the stars and, and hope to, to get to the top, so that's my goal. <laughs> Let MTV.